That's a very big deal, actually, because it, it looked for a while like, OK, the Fed is going to ease and interest rates are going to go back down. And, and pretty soon um, um, we'll, we'll be back in one of those cycles where there's very easy money and everybody can buy anything. And, and um, that, that kind of happened for a little while. And it still feels like it's happening in the stock market. But in general, that's not the case in the U.S. You know, we're running big deficits and that's very stimulative. But if interest rates are going back up, you know, the... Um, the 10-year treasury yield went down to 3.5% from 5%. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to, watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. I am on the road in Thailand. And uh, John and I are roughly 9,000 miles or 8,000 miles apart here. And uh, we're still doing the show. The show must go on, John. Hey, Carrie. Greetings from the first world. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's it's dinner time here, so that must mean that it's breakfast time for you, right? Exactly. And I started eating breakfast again, a practice I've stayed away from for years now. But I'm eating breakfast, but I keep it down to two meals a day. I can't do three meals a day anymore. I just can't it's something with age man i don't know i just can't eat three meals a day well but but when you're in an exotic foreign country you got to eat their breakfast and yeah. all their other meals too you got you got to sample it all so good I, now i'm picturing like um for thai breakfast i'm picturing like octopus and squid and stuff like that is that what they eat for breakfast they they don't have like they do a western breakfast uh, i'm staying at the hilton here they do a Western breakfast, but they do the Eastern breakfast, which is you eat the same food all day long. Uh, it's not breakfast per se. It's just the same food you're eating. And well, uh, see, that that's always how it used to be. You ate for breakfast what was left over from dinner. Right. So, OK, that makes yeah. sense. Made sense. Yeah. So anyway, hey, well, we should be celebrate breaking out the champagne. Bitcoin has uh, eclipsed the $50,000 mark. Uh, Nick Santiago called it. I mean, we thought it was going to go a lot lower under 20,000. Maybe those ETFs or ETPs, exchange traded products, are starting to have an effect on the price, John. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you'd kind of think that, except that um, a lot of those those ETPs, um, or all of them, are just are, are synthetic. They use futures contracts to replicate the movements of Bitcoin. So it's not like they're, you know, getting a bunch of Bitcoin and storing it, taking it off the market. But I don't really know the details of that. So it's possible that some of the ETFs are actual, you know, analogs to physical ETFs. And uh, and that's yeah. leading to a lot of demand for Bitcoin. So that's that's a possibility. Hey, we could say this, that the uh, ETPs for uh, digital assets are the analog of GLD and SLV. They got all this <laughs> stuff on their books, but do they really have it? I don't know. Supposedly, my best friend Jeff says that Fidelity has the coins. They actually possess them. But you know what? It's an ETP, which is a tracking product. It's not physical physical Bitcoin, which is an anomaly anyway. So it's going to be interesting to see what's happening. I told you, like, I buy a certain amount of Bitcoin every Monday. And when it I swing trade it, when it hits peaks, I dump out of it. But here, it went over 50. That's probably enough momentum to take it close to 60, in my opinion. But we will find out soon enough. So, hey, interest rates are rising again. Yeah, that's that's a very big deal, actually, because it, it looked for a while like, OK, the Fed is going to ease and interest rates are going to go back down. And, and pretty soon um, um, we'll, we'll be back in one of those cycles where there's very easy money and everybody can buy anything. And, and um, that, that kind of happened for a little while. And it still feels like it's happening in the stock market. But in general, that's not the case in the U.S. You know, we're running big deficits and that's very stimulative. But if interest rates are going back up, you know, the um, the 10 year treasury yield went down to three point five percent from five percent. Right. 
And then it went back up just lately to like 4.2%. Um, and, and uh, you know, that doesn't sound like much of a move, but in, for instance, the mortgage market, it's a very big deal because it puts us back above 7% in mortgages. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife and I are thinking about buying houses for our two kids. So I'm really interest rate sensitive right now. And um, houses in the places where we're looking have not really come down in price. There aren't a lot of sales happening, but the prices are still at their, their completely unaffordable bubble levels. And now mortgage rates are going back up to 7% and above, which means that, um, you know, if you couldn't afford a house three years ago um, at, at the price back when you could get a 3% mortgage, there isn't a chance in the world that you've been able to buy that house. You know, you know, if you buy a house now um, with a 7% mortgage, your total interest cost equals the price of the house. So over 30 years, you in effect buy two houses instead of one house. Um, so yeah. that's not the kind of thing that is, is, survivable for the housing market. You know, we have to have a housing crash pretty soon. There's no way around it. And that's just one of the things that's coming now that the people have concluded that the Fed isn't going to start cutting rates immediately. Like we're not going to go back to, to QE on a massive scale and negative interest rates. Um, the economy hasn't slowed down in a demonstrable way yet um, to justify the Fed doing that. And if that's not happening, then what does that mean for these crazy tech stocks that are now, you know, at, at, at and beyond 1999 levels? NVIDIA, um, you know, I was going to short NVIDIA when it first spiked. Um, and I couldn't figure out how to do it because the uh, the stock was on the list of hard to short, you know, hard to borrow stocks. So you can't just directly short. And then the... Um, the the option premiums for put options were right, right. they were insanely high so i i didn't do it and boy am i glad i didn't because nvidia kept on going up i, I read a thing the other day that said that it added a new tesla in market cap yeah. in, in the last few months so these are short candidates you know these are things that are going to fall by 50 percent mm -hmm. and not even be um um fairly valued at the time but where do you short them? Man, the entry point for something like this is just incomprehensible. You know, it's very hard to call. And the danger of missing it, you know, and, and shorting it at the wrong time is outrageous. So I'm not sure how to play it yet. Remember, uh, the man said the market can uh, remain uh, irrational longer than you can remain solvent, right? Yes. And it really, I'm, I've found that out <laughs> a couple of times. Because, <laughs> hey. um, and when something really starts to run, it, it runs beyond rationality. It overshoots. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back and overshoots the other way. But calling the point where it's going to overshoot and head back your way is very hard. And uh, I'm going to short some more, but I'm, I'm going to do it with like S&P 500, SPY yeah, shorts or something like that. Safer. You know, put options on on the on the, the uh, Qs, you know, the, the NASDAQ 100 or the SPY or something like that. You don't have 10 bagger potential with things like that, but you do have five bagger potential. And I, I yeah, think, yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, for the liquidity, which means lower put option premiums and the fact that they're not as wildly overvalued as the worst stocks means that, um, you know, you, you, you aren't looking at losing everything in three months or something like that. And you, you have more time to be right. So, uh, I'm going to start doing that. So we'll see. You know, we'll talk as as it goes along. But I'm going to increase the level of my shorts uh, going forward now because this is just a ridiculous market. Yeah, Goldilocks uh, market price for perfection and all that good stuff. In the meantime, the uh, CRE uh, meltdown continues. And we find out just like the subprime crisis uh, with the mortgage-backed securities, the European banks uh, jumped in with both feet and are getting burned now. Well, the, the American banks, especially the smaller American banks, have a ton of real estate related debt on their books. And a lot of that is CRE, commercial real estate. And a lot of that is uh, office buildings. And office buildings are a nightmare. You know, they, um, they for reasons that we've talked about before, are, are just a mess because um, originally a lot of these buildings went up with very low interest rates. 
So it was cheap to build them. And then during the pandemic, people found out that they uh, they really don't like working in, in an office. They'd rather stay home and you know miss the commute, not have to get dressed up and cleaned up. They they gain three hours a day. So more and more people who have the ability to um, to win that argument are allowed to stay home now. That means office buildings have really low occupancy rates and they're not generating enough cash flow. And so you're seeing a lot of people are tracking office buildings out there and finding examples of an office building that was $120 million three years ago. Now it's selling for $42 million, you know, things like that. And those embedded losses are on bank balance sheets. So when those um, office buildings change hands, the banks have to report the losses. And that's a very big deal. But now, now anyhow, it's a big deal for US, but it's also turning out to be a big deal for Europe. A lot of European banks have US commercial real estate on their books. And so they're on the hook for this stuff too. And Europe is already a mess. You know, Germany, we could spend the whole show just talking about what a catastrophe the German economy is, which is wild because five years ago, you and I would have been saying the opposite, that Germany is basically the only well-run country left in the world. <laughs> now they're the worst run country. They screwed up so monumentally. Angela Merkel, who used to be this kind of rock solid conservative lady who didn't make stupid mistakes, turned out to make stupid mistake after stupid mistake and will go down in history as um, probably the worst Western leader <laughs> in human history. So, because everything she did was turned out to be wrong in retrospect, yeah. you know, they um, they opened their borders, they let an insane number of immigrants from incompatible cultures come in, and then they shifted completely out of nuclear um, and into um, wind and solar, which don't work in Germany because Germany is neither sunny nor windy. And they they loaded up or they committed themselves to Russian natural gas, and then they allowed the U.S. to blow up the Russian or Russian natural gas pipeline. So Germany is deindustrializing, and you take them out of Europe, Europe is toast. And uh, yeah. and that is the next couple of years for Europe. You know they're uh, they're going to level down to instead of a first world system to second world at best. You know they're going to be much poorer than they think they are. I think you are correct on that score, John. And uh, hey, uh, you know, one of the things that's keeping the U.S. afloat is even though the rest of the world is doing so uh, badly, they're doing worse than us. And the perception of the safe haven, look, China is imploding. Where are those wealthy people putting their money? They're putting it into the U.S. I mean, there's zillions of dollars. So the flow of funds from global hot money, whatever, flight capital, is all coming to the US into the stock market because they're not buying government debt with their flight capital, they're buying stocks. So I think a lot of that is why it's going up and it's happening in Europe now as well. So, uh, hey, we got, uh, you know, nat gas prices keep going down and, uh, and then uh, the admin uh, bans uh, new LNG exports. Like, what's going on here? We have more nat gas than we know what to do with <laughs> in this country. What are they thinking? Well, I, it looks like this was a a plan on the bar part of the Biden administration to make the economy look as good as possible going into the election. So what they did was they banned the uh, the export of liquid natural gas, um, and that left the U.S. with a, um, a surplus of gas domestically, you know, what would have been exported is just sloshing around here now. So the price is way down. So anybody who uses natural gas, for instance, to heat their house or to run their stove or whatever, uh, and that's still a big part of the country, um, is seeing the prices go down, the costs to heat their house and run their stove go down, which means their life is no longer as expensive and they don't blame the government for raging inflation anymore. I think that's the Biden administration plan. That's what they're doing? Well, I, th I think to the, to the extent that, um, you know, natural gas is an issue for people, this helps. So, yeah, I think that's part of it because, um, you know, let, let, let me be blunt. These guys are capable of anything. I'm talking about the, the powers that be right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think literally... Um, if if it took a false flag attack on a jet 
plane that kills 100 people to get the current administration elected again, they would do it. You know, that's just how the guys in charge operate. So I, I think anything we see out there, out there that goes wrong in the next six months, and I'm not saying the Republicans are the good guys. I'm saying that yeah. um, anybody in charge thinks this way now, and it happens to be the Democrats and their allies who are in charge right now. And I, I think that any kind of false flag thing that you can conceive of, they would be willing to do in order to win. So any horrific thing that happens in the next six months, um, your first impulse should be to blame it on the government. And only then, if it becomes super clear that it couldn't possibly have been the government, then you start looking for other examples. But uh, but yeah, you know. I agree. And, and Yeah, and, and that means the world is a very scary place because you've got people in power who are willing to do pretty much anything to hold on to power. And if it takes another pandemic, forget it. That's, I mean, that's easy peasy for these Thanks guys because the they already yeah. did it once. You know? I mean, they already did it. They know exactly how. So um, remember uh, just lately, they were talking about disease X or something like yeah. that, the next pandemic. Right. And, um, you know, they tried monkeypox and that didn't work because it had a humorous name. So nobody could be afraid of it. Um, <laughs> But uh, they'll come up with something else or, you know, or a um, mm -hmm. um, a, a cyber attack or yeah, a cyber attack or uh, the, aliens are going to attack. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, that's see the aliens landing on the White House lawn is the um, that's the last on their list because that's the hardest to pull off. But, you know, they've got holograms or something like that. That's uh, that that will make it possible. They've got some kind of um, advanced A.I., yeah. Um, imagery that uh, that they'll use, and and they will use it if nothing else works. So, you know, twenty twenty four is going to be one for the history books from a theatrical standpoint because everybody's willing to do whatever it takes, Anything. and we have the tech to do all kinds of things now. So I I don't even want to guess what they're going to pull, but just remember, anything that happens is probably fake, and just respond to it by buying gold. Okay, or silver. <laughs> just do that, yep. and uh, and and just let your stacks accumulate, and then don't worry about trying to figure out exactly what their reasoning is or how they pulled it off or whatever. You know they did it. That's enough. Buy yep. gold. Exactly. Hey, so so uh, speaking of the admin, we had this special counsel report on uh, Biden's handling of classified documents. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, everyone's surprised that basically the guy is non compass mentis. Now, you'll remember, you probably don't, but five years ago, I wrote an article, well, maybe four years ago, right before the election called The Emperor Has No Cortex, right? <laughs> it's just like, why is anybody surprised over this? It's been obvious for years now that this guy has lost it and, uh, you know, that that he's a puppet. There's no other explanation for what's happening. He's not running anything. Maybe Hunter Biden's running the administration for all we know. Okay, this, this was just too funny, not to mention, you're right, because basically the story is um, they, they were indicting Trump and trying to imprison him for things he did with classified um, documents after he was president. But then it turned out that Biden had done basically the same thing. You know, he had a garage full of classified documents. <laughs> and uh, so they they felt obligated. If they were going to try to put Trump in prison, you know, the Biden DOJ felt obligated to, uh, to look at him, too. So they looked at him, too. They interviewed him and everything. And they came back and said, well, we he clearly did a bunch of stuff that's absolutely illegal. He did it with an understanding of, you know, that it was illegal, but we can't indict him because in a trial, people would see, the jury would see that he was just a, an old man with memory problems and, you know, he's with dementia. So yeah. they we couldn't convict him because you have to have intent um, to convict somebody of something like this. And it's clear that he doesn't have enough of a mind left to have that kind of intent. And so so he got off. Yeah. And and so the administration now is like, well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> He's not going to yeah. be indicted. 
but he's not going to be indicted because he's senile. Yeah. And so to watch these guys squirm is just hilarious, man. Uh, so, it's Gary, let, let's do a let's let's do a a pool now and and guess which what day they will replace Biden with Michelle Obama. Um, gonna, I, she's going to well, be the one. You really think so? She, huh? She's the one they want, but she doesn't want to do it. Gavin Newsom desperately wants it, but they can't replace Biden and Harris with a white guy. No. Right. Because if they if they just got rid of Biden, Kamala Harris would win. And then we would we would have a black woman president. And the Democrats cannot get rid of the black woman and replace her with a white guy. They can't do that. There's no way they can do that. So no. Michelle Obama is the logical choice because you just swap one black woman for another black woman and, and you've got your diversity there. But um Michelle Obama yeah, well, happy. Okay. She's been exposed to what it's like to be in that fishbowl. Yeah, she don't want it. Part of it. Yeah. So I don't know what they're going to do, but they, they need, they know they need to do something. And I think they don't know what they're going to do either, but you know, it could be some kind of a hail Mary where they just grab somebody out of, you know, out of left field and slot oh. them in there as long as they tick enough boxes on the assumption that Trump is easy to beat. And we'll see. I don't know. This is the most hilarious election ever. Yeah. As long as we don't end up in, in um, you know, a civil war, which we're reasonably close to right now. So, <laughs> you know, so barring the civil war, this is hilarious. Okay. So uh, I'm thinking when you're talking about checking boxes, the former president of uh, Harvard University is available and mm. she could be perfect because she checks like so many boxes she checks boxes they didn't even know they had until well, they you, found her you know if she hadn't already had her downfall she mm. would be on the short list if uh, <laughs> right this minute you know they'd be thinking wow man harvard okay harvard and then look at all these other boxes that she ticks um, let's just slot her right in there, you know, and then we'll just tell her when to invade whoever and when to press the nuclear yeah. button. That's that'll be fine, you know. And oh, Carrie, <laughs> you know that we can joke about this is uh, is is a sign of how crazy the world is right now because we shouldn't you shouldn't be able to joke about this stuff because it's oh it's it's, it's bad from beginning and then the Texas thing, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, you've probably you've probably covered this already, so your audience is probably. Um, um, yeah, very well versed in our incipient civil war, but let me know if there's anything else that needs to be filled in about that. So, yeah, well, we, I don't know that I've talked about it on the show. So basically the Supreme court said that the feds could go in and cut the razor wire <clears throat> that Texas has erected on the border. The governor of Texas declared an invasion and sent troops down there and they, in light of the Supreme Court's uh, decision, it just added more razor wire because the decision didn't say they couldn't add more. It just said that the feds had the right to remove it, but the Border Patrol won't go in there to remove it. And uh, now a bunch of states, I think 13 states, have pledged National Guard troops to Texas. The admin hardcore people are saying, let's nationalize the uh federalize the National Guard, which generally in the past, and I don't know if it's changed, required the consent of the governors in question to federalize the Guard. Because when we go back to Hurricane Katrina, uh, the Bush administration through FEMA tried to federalize the Louisiana National Guard. The then governor, Catherine Blanco, I always called her Catherine Kathleen draws a Blanco, she refused to sign the federalization order. And they said, okay, and they left. And then we had Hurricane Katrina and Bush got blamed for it anyway. So I don't know if the law has changed since then, but under the existing law, federalization was required uh, with the consent. And even Trump tried to send the guard to uh, DC for January 6th and he asked the uh, then mayor, do you want the guard? And she said, no. And that was it. And then we had January 6th. So it's an interesting legal issue. It's I don't think they can federalize them under the Constitution. And then that would just precipitate the ultimate clash between the states. And we got 26 states 
And, uh, and then the other states, most of the people don't want what's happening now on the border to be happening anyway. This is a policy driven by elites, by NGOs, and by, uh, by big companies looking for cheaper labor here, John. Well, okay, let me say two things about this. One is that um, the, these NGOs that are down in Mexico and helping people come into the U.S. illegally should be rounded up and imprisoned in a heartbeat, okay? They're breaking the law. They have no business doing that. Lock them up and and do it publicly because you get a 70-30 advantage electorally yeah. out of doing that. Now, the, the other part of that is I think, you know, the Republicans, they, they've been you know, frustrated over this open border that Biden has imposed for a long time. But I think the timing of this now is uh, is pretty specific. Um, Texas started doing this right now so that the issue bleeds over into the election campaign. And their goal is to make Biden um, go down there and impose the federal government's will on Texas and then explain it. That's the whole key to everything. They want <laughs> Biden to have to stand in front of a camera and explain what he's doing. And they know he can't do it. I mean, that that is too many complex thoughts strung together at once for him to be able to, to, to actually articulate it. And, and then if he can't do it, then the people who are actually responsible for it in the federal government will have to step up and explain it. And we'll see the deep state, you know, exposed in all exposed. its glory. Hey, yeah, all yeah. about so money. I'd, yeah, it's all about winning the next election. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, but the open border thing, yes, is is partially about money for sure. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. And now Trump is running on a policy of basically rounding up millions of illegals and showing them the door. But the people that sent them to us don't want them back. So where do they go? We put them well, on the Gitmo, right? I mean, no. From from Trump's point of view. Um, the the most electorally most you know the most popular thing he could do is shut down the border completely and then spend the next three years rounding up all the people who came in here illegally. It just take them across the border to Mexico and drop them off. You know Mexico yeah. shouldn't have let them in in the first place. I mean I'm liter I'm not joking. I think that's what they should do. Just yeah. drop them off on the other side of the Texas border, and. Um, and then, you know, to the extent that any of them need to be processed, they go through the uh, the official channel and they, they submit their application from Mexico and then they uh, they go through the steps that anybody else, all right. our parents did, all the all the people who are doing it legally do to um, to become American citizens and uh, and there should be no other alternative. You shouldn't just be able to walk across the border and then disappear into uh, Michigan or wherever and uh, and never be heard from again. So, uh, you know, I think as long as Trump, uh, if he's the next president, let's say, can show busloads of people that he's catching and sending across to Mexico, he, he's a majority president. Yeah. <laughs> because people will, people will see that and go, OK, Trump's doing what he's supposed to do. Hey. Yeah. It's a new catch and release. We catch them here and we release, release them, them Mexico. there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, that's this is exactly. madness. I mean, um, look, it's it's not quite analogous to Rome being overrun by the Visigoths because the population of the country is far larger than the invading force. But this is an invasion. And I think Trump would be within his rights to declare it an invasion and take all necessary steps to uh, to undo it, to end it, and to send the people back. And I don't think the Supreme Court's going to try to stop them from doing it, because, you know, maybe it maybe it, we wind up with martial law. I don't know. Well, hey, it's a big uh, issue. We'll be talking about more in the weeks to come for sure. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Because uh, the beach is calling me here. The beach in Thailand is calling me. Hey, questions, comments, kl at kerrylutz.com. Don't forget John Substack, rabino.substack.com. And uh, make sure you sign up for your free newsletter at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. We're starting, John, the Inflation Cafe, inflation.cafe. And uh, the newsletter, first one's going to go out this week. And pretty excited about it. It's based on my experience 
of going to a certain undisclosed coffee shop that we all know and well and love, um, the largest chain in the world, and realizing I was paying double for a price of coffee that I was paying three years ago. They cut back on their rewards, and I had half a cup. And I said to the uh, manager, you're not in business of selling coffee. You guys sell inflation. Thus was born the concept of the inflation cafe. And, uh, you know, he just kind of laughed. But I am the uh, the chief editor. I am the editor and chief barista of the inflation cafe. So we're transitioning here. <laughs> Barry, they mess with the wrong guy. Hey, man. It's like seven freaking dollars for a drink. I can't believe I was paying more than four dollars for, and it was overpriced at four dollars, John. At seven, it's just highway robbery, and I, I can afford it, but why? You know, I cut back. And the beauty is here, here in Thailand at the same uh, undisclosed coffee shop, it's three bucks. Gary, do you have a second more for me to go on an inflation rant? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, you see these guys like Paul Krugman or basically anybody that uh, is in the current power structure saying, oh, the economy is so good. Look how low unemployment is. And inflation is down to two and a half percent. And why are people so mad still? You know, and what they don't realize is that we raised a lot of people's living um, expenses by 30 percent. Okay. <laughs> And now we're coming to them and saying, look, the, the further increase is only 3% a year. Well, we already raise their cost of living to the point where they, they have to decide between driving to work and feeding their kids. So the fact that it's only prices are only going up by another 3% a year um, does not help them and does not make them happy. And that's what the guys in charge can't figure out because to them, it's irrelevant. You know, the, the cost of a Starbucks coffee is just not a factor in life. Neither is the cost of a, a tank full of gas or you know one week's worth of groceries or anything, but to everybody else, it's a big deal. And they've ruined it for yeah. this huge section of the economy. That's, that's why. That's why there's so much um, angst out there right now. And, and John, let's face it, we're both right around the same age, a year of each other in our uh, late, we're pushing 70. We lived through the last inflationary period, 60s, 70s, early 80s. So we understand it. But most of the people alive today, John, had no no clue what inflation was. They didn't live through that. Just like they don't know what a bear market is. Um, most of the most of these kids on Wall Street now, most of the people walking the planet don't know what inflation is. They haven't lived through an inflationary cycle like we did and like our parents did post World War II. So I think that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of like uh, putting this newsletter together in a new site is I want it to uh, to people to understand where it comes from, why it's happening and that they're really being taxed silently against their will, against their consent. It's a stealth tax inflation, and it's rampant now. So we'll leave it at that. Hey, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks when I'm back home and uh, got my equipment. Everything is locked up right now. I actually went to the safe deposit box and threw my desktop computer in it so that uh, – you know, because you can't lose your data, you know, even though I'm backed up three ways to sundown, um, four ways, actually. Anyways, it's all locked up. So, all right, John, hey, make sure you go to John Substack, rabino.substack.com. I want to see an article on inflation, John. All right. Carrie, send me what you do, and I'll post it over there, okay? All right, cool. You got all it. Right. All right. We're Good. working on it now. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Be well, all. See ya.